I wonder if we will have ears to hear. When Jesus would tell his stories as a way of teaching, he would often say, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Will we have ears to hear? Will we have ears to hear what the Spirit of God wants to say to us and through us throughout this Lenten season as we encounter these stories from Jesus? They are, in particular, parables, which are a certain kind of story, you know. And there, there's a difference, for instance, between a fable and a parable. A fable is primarily didactic. A clever story meant to offer some kind of insight or instruction about life. Think slow and steady wins the race from the tortoise and the hare. Or honesty is always the best policy from the boy who cried wolf. Fables are valuable when you want to give good advice or teach memorable, practical lessons. Parables are different. We're going to be looking at a parable each week during Lent, and parables are not fables. Parables are different. Parables are intended to be disruptive, to interrupt what you thought you knew, and not just teach you something new, but perhaps surprise you with an unwanted truth. Emily Dickinson was probably talking about poetry, but could easily have been writing about parables when she wrote, Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise as lightning to the children eased with explanation kind. And here's the line. Here's the line. The truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. The truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Truth, difficult and challenging, often unwanted truth, must ultimately and most often comes to us clearly, but unlike many of the great prophets, the great poets realize that truth must sometimes dazzle us gradually if we're ever going to truly see it. And this is perhaps why Jesus spoke in parables, especially when he spoke about the coming kingdom of God. Perhaps he knew that neither his original hearers nor us who are listening now have the capacity to take all of the truth in at once without ultimately rejecting it. Perhaps that's why the life of Jesus still seems to grow in us at a pace that is slower than the wheat we heard about in the parable a moment ago. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head, and then eventually, finally, we hope that the harvest we've all been waiting for might just one day come. Eugene Peterson has said parables are in this sense like narrative time bombs. You hear them, tick. You wonder about them, talk. You think maybe you've got it. Maybe you understand what is being communicated through the parables, tick. But then maybe, talk. Over the course of the week, tick. The truth Jesus actually meant to convey to you suddenly, unexpectedly strikes home and boom! It either overwhelms you with its implications, or as Dickinson said, it blinds you with its illumination. And I wonder if that might happen to any of us this week. As the parable that we just heard, that little parable about the growing seed, as it begins to take root in us and to grow. I wonder if anything like that might happen to us this week. Will any of us here this morning have ears to hear the Spirit and what the Spirit is trying to say to us individually and to our congregation? It's hard to say. 
But I'll be eager to see, because while some parables we'll look at throughout this Lenten season just explode with so much meaning, it's hard to describe it all at once, this little one dazzles a bit more slowly. In fact, it's dazzling me still. I don't know about you. It's kind of ironic, actually, because the idea of a slow, gradual, and yet ongoing work that eventually dazzles in surprising ways is actually the truth sitting at the center of this parable. To understand that, we've got to know our Bibles well, like the original hearers did. And we've also got to begin at the end. And at the end of the parable, this is what Jesus says. As soon as the grain is ripe, He puts the sickle to it. You may have heard this in the song a minute ago, too. He puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And friends, that is precisely when his original hearers would have began to have a sneaking sense of what Jesus was up to here. Because see, this, all of this, all of this harvest imagery that is being used here is being borrowed from the prophet Joel who speaks of the sickle or the blade as a a grain being at harvest time as a way of speaking prophetically about God's coming judgment in the kingdom of God. A promise that these people here had been waiting for for quite some time. These people, in fact, that were listening to Jesus right here were longing for justice, and in fact, the very reason they were listening to Jesus is because they were longing for justice. Justice is what prompted them to come into the presence of Jesus and listen to so intently to what he was proclaiming in the first place. It was all about justice for them. They were longing for a day when God's kingdom would come and God's will would be done on earth as it is for in heaven, and for them that meant entering into a new kind of promised land. Which meant that one day their enemies would be overthrown. Their oppression would be alleviated. Their struggles and strife and suffering would come to an end and then they as God's people would begin to experience the harvest of God's abundant life even as their enemies began to reap the harvest of God's exacting justice and judgment. They've been waiting for God's coming kingdom, God's fulfilled promises for a new day and for a new life for quite some time. And so there was this question hanging over their head as they heard Jesus share this parable. A question that he is at least subtly indicating that he is the answer to. And here's the question. Maybe it resonates with you. Is it ever going to happen? Is it, when's it going to happen, this thing we've been waiting for? In fact, these people have been waiting for so long they were probably unsure that it was ever actually going to happen. Can you resonate with that? Have you ever felt like that? Like there's this something you've been waiting for, hoping for, longing for, but you're starting to believe actually it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Is it ever going to happen? When is it going to happen? Are they ever going to give me that raise, that promotion, that new job, some might ask? Am I ever going to find my soulmate, some young person might ask, or do I even have a a, a soulmate? Am am I ever going to get any better? Am I ever going to break through this spiritual, emotional, physical, professional ceiling? Am I ever going to break through to the next thing? What's it going to take for me to figure this thing out? What's it going to take for me to reach my full potential? Or is this my full potential? Will they ever find an answer? Will there ever be a cure? Will this pain ever end? A young parent might ask, will this baby ever sleep through the night? Will my child ever be out of diapers? Will my baby, my all grown up baby, find her way again? 
Or will that person ever stop persecuting me? Will they ever be held fully accountable? Will they ever get what they deserve, God? These are the kinds of questions that are sprouting up all over Galilee during the life and ministry of Jesus. In every way these people could name, they were wondering what many of us may be wondering as we look at our outer world and at our inner worlds right now. And that is when? When is God's kingdom going to come? Or even is God's kingdom going to come? Is it ever actually going to happen? And these are great questions. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus would just give us clear and concise answers for our questions? Wouldn't it be nice if when we ask these really good questions, if Jesus would just give us clear and concise answers? Why won't He do that? Perhaps, quite frankly, because He knows that for some of us and for some of them, the truth would always come too quickly. And that when they saw it, it would blind them. And that it would blind them so much, it would startle them so much that they would reject it and eventually they would do everything in their power to kill it. Some do that. Some would do that. Others wouldn't. Others, we know, only simply needed him to slowly, gradually close the gap between the questions they thought they were asking, like, when is God's kingdom going to come? And the questions they were really asking, like, when is God going to do what I think ought to be done? Many of us here this morning need Jesus to close that gap for us as well. In fact, the most important thing that may happen for many of us today is for God to close the gap between what we believe God ought to be doing in our lives and in the world and in this church and what God is actually and ought to be doing in our lives and in the world and in this church. We need God to close that gap for us. Jesus prompts our thinking on that by pointing us here to creation. This is what he says. This is what the kingdom of God is like, Jesus said. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, it produces grain. Now notice, notice here. There is a connection between the life of the man and the life of the seed in the parable. So do you see it? The man sleeps and gets up, sleeps and gets up, sleeps and gets up, and as he does, he grows, no doubt because of his, some, some of his own effort, but also just because that's just the natural order of things. Without even trying, you and I age. We, we sleep and get up and we grow and we change. And this happens without us putting much effort into it all. Some of us parents, grandparents, like to talk about the terrible twos, right? Think about the terrible twos and how terrible it's going to be when the kids are two. Um, thinking about the terrible twos with our kids, I, I always kind of felt like when we got to the twos, that we were getting off easy. I thought, you know, th this is really, what is all this that people are talking about? Terrible twos. I mean, it kind of lulled us into, this isn't so hard. I mean, this isn't that big of a deal. I guess we lucked out. The twos aren't that terrible after all. And then they turn three. <laughs> and we like to call our three-year-olds three-nagers. You may also have or know a three-nager. Guess what? All of our three nagers will one day be teenagers and we'll all wonder where the time went. She'll sleep and get up, she'll sleep and get up, she'll sleep and get up, and without even trying, there is something about the way she is designed by God that will cause her to just continue to grow and grow and grow. And science can help us understand why this happens to some degree and at some level, but at another level, life and growth are just a mystery. 
There is something embedded in the way we were designed by God that sends us into these cyclical patterns, normal life that brings about growth. And we see this in creation too. The farmer in the parable has scattered seed. Now did you notice we're not told if there was any plowing or watering that happened. Just just the man scattered seed. So, so, So the farmer participated in the growth of the seed by doing this little thing. Just as he participates in his own growth, and even in the growth of God's work in the world, but there's still all of this mystery. That embedded in the DNA of the universe is something that makes this whole process work. That a seed can hit the ground and then automatically begin to go through this process where it moves into the soil and it dies and it it germinates and then slowly brings about life in the soil and through the soil. And by the way, in case you were wondering, and you probably weren't, when it says in the passage that the man sleeps and gets up, the word gets up is the same word that can be translated resurrection. What is Jesus trying to tell us here? Namely, that the DNA of God's kingdom includes the same creative genius that is embedded in all of creation, in everything else that God has designed. This is what Jesus is hinting at in verse 28 when he says, all by itself, all by itself, without any help from us, the soil produces grain. Now the key Greek word there is the word atom, which is where we get our word automatic or automated. Just as we have automated coffee pots that can be programmed to percolate our coffee at a certain time in the morning. God has designed the universe and so many things in it with the possibility for life to flourish without that life ever being overly managed or controlled. Children will gradually grow from three teenagers to teenagers. Seeds will gradually grow from kernels into stalks. The earth will continue to grow naturally in all the ways that it has and does. The universe, we now know, will continue to expand. That's how it works. It continues to expand for whatever reason. Only God knows. And In the same way, the kingdom of God isn't just coming, but it has been planted and is naturally growing among us. It's already been planted. And it's naturally growing among us night and day, night and day, though the man in the parable knows not how. The men and women who were listening to Jesus that day knew not how either. They knew not how and they really knew not who was doing it either. And this certainly had to be part of the point. These people were longing for the harvest The coming kingdom and the coming judgment described in Joel and right here, right now, in the midst of their longing, the great harvester is telling them both that the kingdom has already been growing all around them and that they are now living in the age of harvest. So they're sitting around longing and wondering, when is the kingdom going to come? When's God going to make the kingdom come? And Jesus is saying to them, guess what? It's already been growing all around you. You may have missed it. You may not see it, but it's growing on its own all around you. And it's time for harvest. And Jesus is asking them by telling them this story, will you see it? When you look around, do you see it? Would they be able to see that they were now standing toe-to-toe with the promises of the prophets? And that the seeds of God's kingdom were more than sprouting, but that the life God wanted for them was ripe for the reaping right then and now? Would they? Some would. Slowly and gradually, we know that some of them would embrace the life that God was growing around them and among them. And others, we know, others of them would be blinded by it. And watch this, pay attention to this, see if you resonate with this one. Others of them would be blinded by the truth of God that was growing all around them and in the name of God and goodness would do everything that they could do to kill it. They'd see the kingdom, 
They'd see God's truth sprouting up all around them, but they wouldn't identify it as that. In fact, they would identify it as the opposite of that. There's a lesson here. There is a lesson here about being on the wrong side of truth that we really ought to learn. And it's really simple. There are a lot of things here that aren't simple, but it is actually really simple. Here it is. Sometimes we are absolutely convinced that we are right and we are not. Sometimes we are absolutely convinced that we are right and we are not. Sometimes we see something and we're so convinced that 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 issue or that person or that idea is against what God wants, when actually the truth is that that issue, that person, that idea is an example of God's ever-growing kingdom. Something we're just not ready for yet. Friends, can we ultimately stop the life of God from growing? I don't think so. Not ultimately. But I do believe we can both help and hinder it. And I do hope that our goal as individuals and as a church would be to help it and not to hinder it. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that we're working with God to cultivate God's kingdom and not against God to kill it? Well, we could say a whole lot about that. But I think right now, moving forward into this week, there's a couple of simple things we can begin to do in our own lives. First, two questions. We can ask, what is it that is mine to do? Each of us sitting here can ask, what is it this week? What is it in my life? What is it that is mine to do? None of us can do it all. No church, no organization, no person, no group. Nobody can do it all, and we don't have to. That's part of the point of this parable. God has designed creation and God's kingdom with an inner automation. It's just growing. But you can participate in it. And you have been cre created by God with a purpose, which is a beautiful thing. So you might ask yourself this week, what beautiful passion or ability or idea or experience needs to be nurtured in you so that God's life can easily and naturally grow from you without hindrance? What is it that is yours to do? And second, this gets a little more general actually. Who is it that it is mine to be? Now this is more this is kind of more about a posture of openness and humility and, and a willingness to receive God's Spirit as it blows and as it is. And it really gets to the heart of the matter because it gets at the heart of how we approach life. Right? It's a matter of the Spirit. So how can we look at that? Well, in Galatians, Paul tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And some of you just had VBS flashbacks. But in light of this, I want you to think about this. You, you know, to keep with this gardening metaphor or farming metaphor, you know, you know what it means to be pruned metaphorically, right? You know what it means to, to prune something. What needs to be pruned in you so that the love of Christ can grow? What is it that needs to be pruned in you so that the joy of Christ can grow? What is it that needs to be pruned in you so that the peace and the patience and the goodness and the faithfulness and the gentleness and the self-control of Christ can grow in you and through you? Or let me ask it another way. Are you known for your gentleness by others? Are you known for your gentleness? Are you known for your patience? 
Are you known for your kindness? Are you known as a person of peace? You might ask people around you that you trust, that you think will tell you the truth, the truth that you may actually be blinded to, and see if you might gradually work with them, people you respect and trust, to grow the life of God in you, to see yourself clearly, and to help the life of God grow in you and through you so that you can be the kind of people who help God's life and God's kingdom grow in this world. What might that mean for you this week? Emily Dickinson said this. She wants to find poetry in this way. If I read a book and it makes my whole body so cold no fire can warm me, I know that is poetry. If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. These are the only ways I know it. May we all also know, at some point this week in our bodies, in our mind, and in our soul, that we have fully encountered the poetry of God. Amen.